All right, how's it going everyone? Just getting this IG live started today. Thank you all for tuning in. Probably gonna say this about a hundred times before the end. Uh, looks like Soil Grown is hopping in now, so just make sure to hit that request button. Uh, again, thanks everyone for tuning in to a really awesome episode today of Instagram Live. We're gonna be having Soil Grown joining us today, talking about all kinds of solventless topics. Uh, just waiting to get him in here. Give me a shout if you're having any problems, Phil. Uh, while we're getting started, just going to sit here for a second, so waiting on that content to get started. So again, thanks to everyone who's joining us here, uh, about to get started. All right, here we go. Cool. Right, connecting with Phil now. Hey, hey what's, what's up, man? Not too much. How about you? Not too much. Cool. Chilling. Hey, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to join us. Uh, really appreciate your time. Oh yeah, dude, I'm stoked. Yeah, glad to be here. How's your week going so far? What's new in your world? Oh, pretty good, dude. I've been uh, making my way out to Adelanto. We partnered up with this new group, uh, Zana USA. They uh, they're a big cultivation group out there, and. I'm super excited about partnering up with them because like to me, a cultivation and an extraction company are just complimentary. Yep. And it's really like what I've been searching for this whole time. And, and these people are really, you know, they see the value in what I do. I see the value in what they do. And, uh, you know, I think that goes a long way. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, that, that's something I definitely want to dig into is kind of what you're up to now and past and present. So for everyone joining us today, uh, we got Phil, Soil Grown Solventless, the man largely credited with founding Modern Rosin as we know it with us today. I'm sure we're going to have a bunch of other awesome hash makers. And then if you've got some questions, feel free to toss them in the question box at the bottom. There's a little question box there. Pretty easy. Uh, a little harder to follow the questions in the comments. Um, now we got everyone joining us today. So tell me, man, what are you smoking on these days? We can start a little casually. You got any flavor profiles or any rosins that you're particularly fond of right now? Uh, yeah, you know what? Like, uh, I've, I've really been loving this blend I've been doing because I'm big on the whole strain blending. Um, so I do a uh, three-part blend. I make this this flavor I call Orange Bang. And it's basically a uh, dosi uh, strawberry and a uh, OG. Okay, nice. And that's something that you sought out and put together. Tell, tell everyone a little bit more about your blend process. That's something I've also seen essential extracts and nicotine do. Um, not super common, but I've definitely had some great flavors of combining strains. What's your What's the method to the madness there? I mean, my whole thing is just about finding the right ratio because anybody can take a flavor and mix them together or mix three flavors together. So for me, it just it becomes like a, a little process, you know, so I'll have each slab of each flavor. And, uh, you know, with if you got five or six strains, you can make a couple other flavor combos. And those are always my favorite. They really are. But like what I'll do is I'll, I'll set up like, you know, I'll, I'll start off with a 50 50. If I'm doing two flavors, for example, you know, mm -hmm. I'll start off with a 50 50 blend and you know we'll go from there so you see what's dominant and then you know i'll change it up sometimes i'll do like a 70 30 and it really depends on the strains you know anytime you have like the the citrus chips like tangies forbidden fruits tropicana mm -hmm. cookies like any of those you really can't go 50 50 otherwise you're just gonna have a slight variation to mm -hmm. a tangy turf so like for me you know sometimes those are like a 70 30 um you know 80 20s you know it just really depends on the ratio and then like when you're doing three part blends, I feel like those are the most unique because it gets really hard to distinguish the strains that were used to make that that flavor profile. You know, it really becomes like a proprietary blend. And like for someone to try to mimic that would be difficult unless like, you know, the information on like the ratio of strains that are being used because there's such a huge combination you can use when especially when you're using three, you know, it could be an equal, you know, third, third, third. Or sometimes there's only 10% of a strain in there that just like it kicked off those two mix. Like, you know, if you have a strawberry and you have a dosi, 
And then you add a little bit of some Tropicana cookies. You can't add too much of it. You know, it really has to be a small ratio of that. And you can go equal on the others, you know, like, like for me, and actually I, I was wrong when I said the orange bang, that's actually strawberry, dosi, <laughs> and it's um, Tropicana cookies. No, so, nice. so that one gives it like that orange kick, but it's not like anything like Tropicana cookies. You can't tell there's straw, strawberry in it, and yeah. they, there's no way to tell that there's dosi dough in it. But it gives it that nice sweet gas mm -hmm. with that uh, that kick of like orange turps. And even like a lot of people who don't really mm -hmm. care too much for the orange turps, yeah. you know, they tend to like this one because it, it's got like a good combination of like you know your gassy turps and like your yeah. your your fruity sweet turps. Mm. So we're getting a bunch of comments here. People are asking, are you doing the strain combos pre-wash, like putting all the material together in the wash and then filtering, going through the normal process, or are you washing those strains individually and then blending it? How, you know, do you have a preference a for that? Really good question. Yeah. So check it out. So with that process, no, I like to actually just wash everything separate until I have okay. an understanding of what that strain can do. So when I, for instance, if I have a strain that puts out 100 grams of water hash, and I have another strain that puts out 100 grams of water hash, and once I isolate everything and I'm able to see that, okay, in my 90 micron, you know, I usually get about, let's just say 50, 60 grams, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and that other strain, if I'm getting close to that ratio and everything's uh, acting about the same, you know, because because different we all know different strains they put out in different microns. Some have bigger heads, some have smaller heads. You'll catch more in the 90s. Some of them are catching more in the 120. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, you know, I'll keep everything separate, and then I'll do blends like that because you know, if if I mm -hmm. just took two strains that I'm unsure of, and I washed them and just mixed them, yeah. I don't know what came out more dominant. I don't know where I'm going to suffer from my yield. What's going to be what gave me the most weight? So whatever is going to yield right. the highest. So really, I don't get to dictate that ratio, you know? Ah, interesting. Because, yeah, and that's kind of my look on it. And, and once I really have the idea, like, for instance, um, mm. the white strawberries that I do, uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll actually wash them together now because I've done enough of the blending um, separately, having it as rosin. And I've also watched, watched them separate so many times that I can see their numbers are so identical in every yeah. micron that I'm still going to get the same thing that I'm looking for. And, you know, after doing like uh, doing it separately and then washing it together and making that flavor blend that way, I really I feel like that just locked in that whole flavor profile mm. because I feel like it just enhances what I'm what I'm trying to get at washing it together compared to like trying to homogenize it in, in like, you know, a taffy mm. pole or because that's where it gets difficult too. you know, for someone who's trying mm. to create a fresh press rosin and doing a flavor blend. If you, if you have two separate rosins, how are you going to blend them? You have to twist them up and, yeah, you know, it's a mess. In some type of way of <laughs> agitation. And yeah, it's a mess. And then at the same time, you no longer have fresh press because you stretched or whipped air into it. Mm -hmm. And now you have this, you know, opaque, uh, uh, a snap and pull or taffy, whatever you want to call it. But mm -hmm. I think if you're looking for a fresh press flavor blend, mm -hmm. obviously washing, as long as you have that understanding of mm -hmm. what your yield and all those, those variables are going to be. Cause I think those are important, especially if you're looking to get consistency every time. And that's mm -hmm. a key consistency. Yeah. If you put out a flavor blend and then next week you put out the same thing and it's not the same, that's horrible. Right. And that's not what consumers are looking for. And I think more and more hash makers that we've gotten the chance to talk to are like so dialed in on the consistency aspect of the products that they're making. So, you know, are you always looking at artisan blends? Do you do a lot of single strain or like single store stuff too? I mean, I'd be curious to know kind of what your philosophy is on where you might choose to blend things versus when, you know, hey, I'm, I'm loving this OG Kush. Or, you know, if you're washing something and it's just like standalone, you're going to put it out. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I always try to, to let everything, uh, to put everything out, like as the strain itself, as mm -hmm. well as blend. So, you know, if, if it's like, these are such great strains, I'll just get more of it. You know what I mean? So you just mm -hmm. get more so that way you can have that, that isolated strain on its own. And then you mm -hmm. can also create flavor blends. Not all strains are are like what you're looking for when you're looking for a flavor blend. And you know, it's all it's all opinion mm -hmm. and, and preference. And for me, you know, I have the terpene profiles I like and stuff. And so it's really like when someone gets that blend, it, you're really just getting what I'm looking for. 
and it's you know i believe that i love quality and and you know the certain terpene profiles i feel like you know majority of people would like so mm -hmm. you know it's just really getting a taste of my my preference you know no that that's awesome and i think a lot of people who are buying products from high-end hash makers like yourselves i think that the hash maker often kind of leads the flavor and a lot of the connoisseurs and the flavor makers and the taste makers kind of follow the hash maker to the new strains that they're tapping into and that you know what the growers are producing so with your new operation, I'm sure people are excited to hear about your products and figure out where they can find some. Are you guys vertically integrated? Are you? Do you have a cultivation team that you're working with or are you sourcing a lot of your material from various cultivators? No, so everything's gonna be uh, in-house. There won't be any outsourced nice. material. So, uh, you know, we partnered up with the cultivation specifically for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they grow a lot of flour and you know, they're they're, they're pheno hunting. They're very proactive as far as, um, you know, trying to get new up and coming strains and, and mm -hmm. hash strains as well. And, you know, I'm a, I feel like I'm playing a big role in that. And as far as like, you know, trying to obtain genetics, trying to uh, push in, mm -hmm. push us in the direction of, of getting, you know, strains that, mm -hmm. that are new and um, that are popular and that have some type of hype behind them. But you know, I'm I'm not so much on the hype as much as I am on something that's just a hash strain. You know, I'll take something yeah. old school that puts out good yield and incredible taste and all that. But uh, you know, for the most part, yeah, everything's gonna be in house. Well, we will be doing collabs and stuff like that. And I'm sure down the road, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't really see outsourcing going, like needing to to source anybody's flowers besides collabs, you know. Right. So you guys aren't going to be doing white label processing. I'm sure you're going to have plenty of your own top shelf buds to process. Uh, before I jump into my next question, just want to repeat it. Thank you all for joining us today. Anyone who's tuning in, we got soil grown here. Got a bunch of good topics to go over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, if you've got questions, ask them in the question box. I'll start sprinkling those in. Uh, and we will also have the full recap after we're done, both on YouTube and Instagram. So if you can't catch the whole thing, uh, we will have the full recap so you can watch every topic from beginning to end. Also, got a lot of awesome hash makers in here. Uh, shout out Dank Duchess, Nick T. I mean, there's so many people in here that are joining us. So, Phil, you really brought the crowd today, man. It's awesome to see. <laughs> Hell yeah. I appreciate all of you guys on, too. Yeah. So uh, let, let's jump into some more, I guess, technical topics and kind of like what we were DM DMing about before, uh, you know, share as much or as little as, you know, you feel comfortable. But, you know, e even though you haven't been super active on Instagram lately, you know, some of those last posts you put out of those THCA rods and, you know, you've really been pushing the boundaries with solventless tech for a long time. Uh, I I'd love to hear, like, what's your experimentation process? Do you experiment a lot? You know, and, and if so, kind of how, how do you go about pushing those boundaries and solventless? Yeah, I mean, for me, the experimentation is the funnest part of it. You know, I love the smoking and the hash and, you know, having that that product to to really appreciate at the end. But it's really mm -hmm. the road that it took to get there, you know, and there's so many different paths you can take. And there's just so many unbeaten paths where it's like, you know, like, it really comes down to experimenting and just like coming up with an idea or even if you think it's going to fail, give it a shot, you know, because mm. sometimes things mess up and you just observe and you, you, you notice things that like you didn't realize or expect to happen. But, you know, that's kind of how you stumble upon new things. Mm. You know, that's how I stumbled upon rosin. Like if it wasn't for mm. Nick Atish showing people how to like, like squeeze out their hash to where it'd be nice and thin and getting dabs off like some lower yeah. microns. I wouldn't have screwed up and I wouldn't have like observed that whole, you know, the shiny mm. oil on the outside and the dry hash on the inside. Like mm. you know, that later down the road sparked something that really like it, it brought it brought the whole idea of like maybe not rosin, but like how mm. I got there, you know, and, yeah. and, and to be real, like the way I tried it first, you know, I didn't set up all this equipment to try this idea that went off in my head. Instead, I. I grabbed a piece of parchment paper, I grabbed a piece of hash, and I pressed it up against an enal with my mm. finger. And, oh. and oil actually came out, and I was hoping that it would, and then it just went from there, you know? From there, it's like, wow, something's happening. I was able to to scoop up a dab and get my father-in-law a dab, and then it just like, you know, so now you're thinking, well, okay, 
that worked, so let's try something else. So I tried like a hair curler, wasn't working. Mm. My wife came out, got mad at me, got me the hair straightener, and it was <laughs> like, you know, that that's where it was like, wow, okay, something flat, hot, and I don't know why I didn't go back to the hair straightener originally anyways, <laughs> but, you know, and then it just kind of goes from there, and things evolve, and yeah, to me, I think experimentation is super important, you know, when it, mm -hmm. especially with like the, the mechanical separation process and things like mm -hmm. that, you know, you really, you can look towards other fields and things like that that people do and just like it gives you an idea it's science you know you apply it it works or it doesn't work and yeah. uh, to me that's that's the the funnest and, and most important factor it's it's how it's how i learn so and i also know that ice water bubble hash really gets kind of the lion's share of the attention in the high solventless community right now but also, you know, with Sift and some of the things that, you know, Cuban and some of the other guys are doing out there with really, really high tier Sift. I know Blue River Terps is, you know, way at the top of that list for doing some crazy stuff with Sift. Are you involved with Sift too much lately? Or are you pretty much focusing on ice water hash? Like, how do you view those two processes? I, I have a lot of respect for the Sift, but I mean, it, I really haven't, I haven't like, focused on it at all i, I put mm -hmm. no effort into it i've really focused yeah. on on ice water hash and just rosin and mechanical separation for the most part okay cool i mean i love it i'm not so i think i think sip also is a very it's a very difficult i think it's probably one of the mm. most difficult solventless processes to because cr to create a like you know, to create a rosin that's quality from sip is difficult you know unless you're getting something along the lines of like cubans quality uh, sift and like Cuban Hash Queen and and like Tony mm -hmm. and, and and Blue River Terps, you know, and all those yep. guys that are, have really pushed the boundaries. And like you know, you look at like 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 Greg on IG. Um, yeah. What Jungle Boys Ross? Yep. He fucking he. I mean, I I remember when he wasn't even doing anything with sift, and the dude's fucking killing it now. Yeah. So like you know, it's really just just applying yourself there. But I've I've really focused most of my energy towards you know uh, ice water extraction and, and mm -hmm. rosin pressing and, and a lot towards mechanical separation over the last couple of years. Yeah, so I know that's one of the topics we wanted to dive into. Seems like the perfect segue. I mean, on the topic of mechanical separation, even though the terms are a little mixed up right now, I don't think anyone's really established perfectly what's going on. But when you're saying mechanical separation, you're meaning isolating out terpenes, isolating out THCA, uh, just to make sure I'm getting my terms right, that's what you mean when you say mechanical separation, right? Yeah, yeah, and what I mean is like a secondary mechanical separation, because it's all mechanical separation, you know, from the, from exactly. the water hash to the rosin pressing. You know, it's just like, um, it's a it's a purifying method, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's definitely mechanical separation. I don't know why I refer to that in that term compared to everything else. I just feel like it, it yeah. you know, I'm actually separating the terpenes the fats and the THCA. So like, to me, that just, it really stuck with me. But yeah, it's more of like a mm. secondary or, or third stage of like refinement, you know? Right. But it's just a term that kind of caught me and I don't know, I always use it and it is confusing. It's definitely confusing. So to address that is- <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I just want to make sure that I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking the same language as you. So concerning that post-process, second or third, you know, post-process mechanical separation, uh, what what have you been getting up to lately? What are you discovering? You know, what's really drawn your attention there? Um, I mean, for the most part, it's it's just like you know, I like the fact that I can separate the THCA from the terpenes, and uh, mm -hmm. and then from there you can kind of go further. You know, you can actually separate some of the fats or most of the fats. You know, I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. I haven't. I haven't like had it tested to be like, oh, it's it is zero fats. You removed all the fats from me. I don't know mm -hmm. that there is a test for that, probably. Yeah. But you know, I'm more of like the fact that I have purified it. I can s clearly see it, and it's all observation. You know, I would have to talk mm -hmm. with a bunch of other people who are doing it too, and I really haven't. I just I'm like mm -hmm. more in my own lane, trying to focus on what I'm doing, and, and you know, like mm -hmm. have personality to it. You know, it's like you know the way I do things. I feel like the more not that I, I, I don't appreciate anybody else's process, because I do. I respect it and I appreciate it. But I feel like the more mm -hmm. that I just focus on what I'm doing and not mm -hmm. really look outwards, the more it's going to be, you know, like my style or my way. It's like, you know, when you when you, you learn to play an instrument and you, you constantly mm -hmm. play these bands, you know, you're going to sound like them. You know, you 
So I just feel like, yeah. you know, me focusing on my ideas and what I think, my 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 uh, my failures and yeah. you know my success with it. That's really what what like shapes the way I make it, you know. And I'm sure someone makes it better, and and there's people who do it a hundred different ways. But mm -hmm. you know, right now I'm just kind of focused on the way I do it, and you know, at some point we can all share our techniques and really fine tune it. Yeah. So. Let me throw a little bit of a curveball at you. What's your hot take on rosin cartridges? Is that something that you guys are at all interested in? Uh, is that something you've tried to make? I mean, where where do you see rosin carts coming into the picture here? Because those are, you know, that that is mechanical separation almost at its most difficult. Uh, do you have any comments on rosin carts? Yeah, I mean, for, for the most part, rosin carts are still in the infant stage i think it's really a lot to do with the hardware what what most mm -hmm. of this hardware has been designed around is you know uh distillate distillate and, and mm -hmm. terpene blends and creating a certain viscosity of of oil that that mm -hmm. these carts are built for and right. with rosin you know it tends to be a, a, a less viscous oil so it doesn't quite move through the cart as well and burn as well mm -hmm. but i have had some carts that were very good um but, you know, with the exception, as you get towards the tail end of the cart, you know, it's not as desirable or quality. And you, you notice some change in the color of the oil or a lot of, like, uh, crashing out of the THC, mm -hmm. the micro crystalline. But for the most part, I think it's evolving quickly. It's getting there. People have it down. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't myself. I haven't yeah. experimented with it too much. You know? And I think it's really based on the hardware. When someone gets their hands on the right hardware, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, sweet you know lucky you because like that's probably the most difficult part separating those you know some people are doing the oven tech and just you know taking mm -hmm. it a little further to where it doesn't want to crash back out some mm -hmm. people are doing the uh you know the thc terpene separation and and going from there and i feel like the ones that are doing the uh terpene separation and stuff i feel like you get more of that terpene fraction and what you're looking for and then once you have that whole terpene fraction you can actually take it a step further you know, and run it through some process of trying to remove fats and lipids and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. even going a little bit further and allowing the, the microcrystalline the THCA to crash out. So that way, mm -hmm. you know, you're actually purifying your turps to another level and creating a lower viscosity for a pen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's just so many factors and variables that, that, that come into play because with the cart that can burn a thicker oil, you know, mm -hmm. you might not have to work so hard to get such a thinner oil. But I right. think it just comes down to a clean burn. And the cleaner the burn, the better it's going to taste. Yeah, so low voltage, low temp. Yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, that, that's some really good insight that, you know, it's not only the viscosity, of course, but it's also the temperature and how everything is playing in that tiny piece of what is meant to be disposable hardware. You know, it, is it going to ruin your hash or not? And it seems like most of the carts out there do, um, at least at least on the hardware side of things. And when I spoke with Mikey with Harvest Moon Gardens a couple years ago at Emerald Cup, he, he was hot on the trot for trying to figure out the right cartridges and the right temps and everything like that. So I guess people have been thinking about it for a long time. Yeah, for sure. People have been going at it and there's so many different techniques to get there, whether, you know, doing jams or doing, you know, the oven tech or the, the, the mechanical separation of THC and the terpenes. But I think it's really cool to see that, that we're already there. Like, you know, in my opinion, I think solventless is making its way to the leaderboard. It really has. Mm. And what I'm seeing a lot of is most people just want to smoke rosin. Not that they don't buy, you know, hydrocarbon extracts and stuff, but it seems even like hydrocarbon art extract artists are, they prefer rosin too and I'm, I'm, <laughs> yep. I'm not speaking for everybody I'm just yeah <laughs> I'm just speaking out of experience and you know the comment of what I've run into and stuff but mm -hmm. it's funny because you know a couple years ago it's like no one expected rosin to be the leader I feel like it's slowly becoming and mm -hmm. it's just becoming a more viable product on the market yeah, we, we go to a lot of trade shows, not so much lately with everything going on, but it's crazy when we talk to the business yeah. owners who run CO2 distillate companies, they will tell me in confidence that they mostly or entirely smoke rosin. So, you know, on that leaderboard <laughs> question, you know, in your personal experience talking to other hash makers, connoisseurs, people in the industry, do you think that Solventless is going to overtake hydrocarbon in the in the premium market or has it already 
Uh, I think without a doubt it will. It probably hasn't already because this market came at a time where, you know, people have their processes dialed in and, you know, years of experience and, and you know, fine tuning equipment and fine tuning the process to where, you know, it's like now we're, we're in a whole new ball game, this whole rec market. You know, you have something that's of value. You're able to create something. So you're going to bring it to you're going to bring it to the game. You're going to bring it to the table. And then now that's what's going to become the business. So it's the common thing. The common thing is to find some type of value in this this crazy extraction equipment that can that can produce with repeatability, you know, and it can produce on high volume. With solventless, right. we're more small batch boutique type, but we're working our way towards uh, volume, you know, and, it's, and right. it's, it, whether it be like the presses we use or multiple presses or multiple machines or multiple hand washing or just yep. high labor. But that's the difference between solventless is it's more labor intensive or um, more manpower compared to a couple guys who can really knock out hundreds of pounds out of a fucking uh, a closed loop system, you know. Mm -hmm. But but yes, I, I really believe it's. I think it's already there because mm -hmm. I do see a lot of these hydrocarbon companies mm -hmm. setting up a, a solventless line because they can. With the type seven, you can yeah. do any type of type six. So I think, you know, people are, are realizing like, you know, maybe cells are slowing down. Maybe it's like, you know, we can't just be one type of company. We should be everything. You know, if you're going to produce quality concentrates, whether that be hydrocarbon or solventless, mm -hmm. you know, you should be able to produce more than just one thing. and. You know, I think the yeah. guys who who have the leg up on the whole hydrocarbon, you know, they have the ability to to learn the solventless techniques and have multiple products out there, which is very beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't hate on it at all, you know. And I think it's it's a it's a little bit of an advantage over some of the solventless guys. But at the same time, the guys who have been focusing is focusing on solventless techniques and methods mm -hmm. and and scaling up with quality. Those those guys are, you know, way ahead of the game. Yeah, we're we're seeing a lot of that in all of the maturing markets. I mean, California, especially where you're at the the most mature market by a mile. Uh, uh, as a as a bit of a side note, and someone put this in the comments that I also plan to ask you about. You know, w what's your take on super high end hash rosin versus full melt? Do you prefer one or the other? Is it strain dependent? You know, full melt is really hard to find, and it's actually really hard to produce. We don't see that much of it. Do you think that full melt's ever going to have a renaissance? I mean, give, give me your take on full melt. I, I love full melt, dude. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love it. But I think it's just like a whole... Like, I always have full melt in the freezer. and But I don't smoke it every day. I, I actually do prefer to, to press it and smoke it. Like, rather than having something that leaves slight amount of char. You know, if, if I'm going to smoke a gram of full melt, you know, it's, it's technically only like 90 to 95% oil. So there's mm. there's five to ten percent contaminant in it. You know, okay. it's less resilient. So as far as like, you know, if you don't have that temp perfect on the nail, you know, and I'm really mm. picky with the taste and everything. Like, I, it has to be fucking perfect <laughs> every time. Otherwise, you know, and, and with 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 full melt, it's there's a smaller window of the right time to hit it, and you know, the mm. right temp and all those variables. But I feel like with rosin, it is a little more resilient. You can hit it a little hotter, get more <laughs> smoke, or hit it a little cooler and just get heavy terps without anything in there to change that taste. You know, like full melt, there's nothing that compares to that first dab off some nice six star on a perfect temp nail. Like yeah. the way the terps hit the lungs and takes the breath away and like the way it coats the mouth, like that is the most yeah. raw way of like smoking terps in my opinion. Yeah. But if I'm gonna smoke, you know, I smoke a lot, you know, so I don't like to clean the nail as like with all that <laughs> contaminant that's left behind or the particulate yeah. and stuff like, I do, it's a lot but, of work. You know, it's, it's it's more special occasion. Yeah, and it's more special occasion when I do break yeah. the melt out. It's like, what? Like, oh, uh. I'm about to fucking smoke some melt? Yeah. yeah you know, and it, it really brings that excitement to it. Mm -hmm. And But for me, yeah, my, my number one personal preference is and always will be rosin. So, great and, segue. You know, you take that 90 oh. micron and press it out. No, please, continue. Go ahead, my bad. No, if you take that 90 micron and press it out, it's just like, to me... It's amazing. It's it's ridiculous. The color, the taste, mm. like just just the whole look of the concentrate and the way it acts, and you know, like you're talking like wet batters and stuff. Like a 90U rosin, it just like almost wants to be wet batter on its own. No type yeah. of manipulation or anything. 
and that's just sitting out on a countertop with the lid off like <laughs> yeah no that I, I made the same analogy in the last ig live i had but you know the best wagyu a5 beef from japan melt at room temperature the, the fat is that good and i think with full melt Jeez. and some of these other like super primo hashes and hash rosins like you, that's what you get. It it changes before your eyes. The terps just want to separate. There's all these things going on there that are that are interesting to see. So, would you say that though, from the commercial hash maker's perspective, that the shelf stability of rosin is it, it, probably a lot friendlier for the customer than some of the full melts are because they just they'll they'll melt literally right in front of your eyeballs. Yeah, they grease up and and yeah, and you know what they do? They grease up and, and a lot of people don't quite understand like they're like oh it looks different you know because like there's a lot of hype you know and the people that really catch the word of the the you know they they hear about it it's like oh uh six star water hash is the best it's the best so they get their hands on it or you know they're willing to try it so they get some and then you mm -hmm. know by the time they get home if they don't have it on an ice pack or something it's like did i lose some it looks smaller <laughs> you know because it melts yeah. down greases up and you know a lot of people they don't they feel like it takes so much to smoke six star like oh i don't know how to press it into a flag or i don't know mm -hmm. how to do this like you really don't have to you can scoop mm -hmm. it and just smoke it you know it's just a lot of like it's a it's a cool like for me i like to play with it you know if i'm gonna if i'm gonna break the hash out i don't want to just smoke it like i want to really appreciate everything about it like you know scooping it into the parchment and finger pressing it and like mm -hmm. you know letting it gloss up and putting it up to the light and seeing the clarity and seeing if it's like did you how good did you do is it peppered mm -hmm. or did you get it to where it's flawless yeah. you know what i mean like, yeah those, those are those are but i think the educate it's all about education 100 percent. and you know what mm -hmm. people aren't educating everybody on full melts mm -hmm. and stuff the masses are talking rosin and the masses are talking pure oil and mm -hmm. the, the the real boutique smokers and the ones that have been smoking a long time and and not not necessarily smoking a long time but who have really you know had someone uh, introduce them into the whole the realm of water hash and like mm -hmm. how great it is and like getting to experience what real six star is and what you know the whole quality mm -hmm. behind it and how it's made and getting to understand that i think those yeah. are the ones who really appreciate the water hash yeah i'm i'm hoping to see more connoisseurs and people enjoy these kinds of products uh, and, and with that in mind, you know, for all the people that are tuned in here, you know, do you have any advice for either newer hash makers or hash makers that are really striving to hit those that, you know, those top levels of quality that are possible? You know, I, I'd love to hear, you know, how, how, what, what advice do you have for, you know, newer hash makers? I mean, my whole thing is uh, for, for the newer hash makers out there, you know, research. Um, you know, look in the right directions. Like, you know, just a lot of research is, is a big key thing. You know, you find those, the people that are doing it, follow them. You know, it might not be what you like or what, but you can pick and pull everything out of it. Take mm -hmm. notes, um, you know, experiment. When you hear something, go home and try it right away. Yeah. But for me, like the number one thing is building relationships with your growers. Because mm -hmm. if, if without the growers, we are nothing. You know, you can have yep. the coolest re relationship with the grower, but if he's not putting out quality quality stuff or if he's not growing the right strains it's it's gonna it's not gonna work out and it never will work out you know you need somebody who's really focused on on resin and not necessarily mm. like trophy flower because there's lots of flour that's incredible but it yeah, it doesn't quite do nugs. what we need it to do for the problem <laughs> yeah and you know what in in, in in the day we're in now it's like you know when we run these strains that are incredible but they absolutely yield nothing you know it gets mm -hmm. really difficult to make that a a, a product because like most people don't want to pay more for it and you know they're like well i can just get it here for this so mm -hmm. you know there, there's a lot of uh, uh difficulties when it comes to things like that but i feel like you know the number one thing is you know reach out to growers talk to growers build relationship with growers um pay attention to what strains you see these hash makers washing and and running because mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's a kind of a common thing you'll see like this strain everywhere this strain everywhere and it's be there's a reason why it's because it does well for what we do you know it's common like you know when you run like a lemon haze or when you run like a, a most ogs you know it's common to fail with them they're really greasy strains and they don't tend to i don't know if it's like the 
the trichomes dissolving or, or what the factor mm -hmm. is that's that's creating so much problems in the the ice water extraction process but you know like some strains yield fat on flower rosin but you go and bring it to ice water extraction and it doesn't do well but that's where like yeah. you know for, for the newer guys out there doing it don't be afraid to fail it costs it does but you know you're not going to college you're not you're not you're not paying for this cannabis college where you know you're paying all this money to learn this knowledge you're paying yourself you're paying for it yourself you put you invest in yourself you go buy those pounds that you you vetted and you talked to and you believed mm -hmm. and you seen everybody else or somebody yeah. else wash it and it killed it and go try it you know and go wash it or go press it and 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 do what you've learned on it but to me i think it really comes down to material is key consistency and material creates consistency all the way up through the process and you know i, I say stay focused research hard um don't get discouraged failure is good failure is really good because when you fail you know you know how to look yeah. back at what you did wrong and it teaches you how to remediate you know when you mm -hmm. mess up and you're like ah i can't lose you know you're gonna figure out how to salvage things and sometimes right. that that salvaging that becomes the best thing you ever did because you learned a whole new process and it like you know watching the process and failures of things like if you mess up with concentrates like what it's like it's not like oh it's gross right you know it's like oh it's not quite the color you wanted it to be or the texture you wanted it to be mm -hmm. you know but you learn how to how to fix it and if you don't you know then you write it off as like hey this is a problem i don't want to ever have because i can't fix it yeah and that's you know that's my advice to all you guys out there making hash you know research you know be passionate about it if you don't love it you're not going to live it you know if you're just trying to do it just to make money i don't know how far you're going to go if if you if you enjoy doing it and if you you love mm -hmm. you know smoking it and smelling it and seeing it and and everything from from the the quality uh flowers that you you know you can hold in your hand whether that be fresh or frozen or, or uh dry or frozen um you know it's like every aspect of it love it yeah. you know love the water hash that comes out love the rosin comes out love the process yeah that's my advice to everybody and don't be afraid to ask questions never be afraid like you know a lot of there's a lot of a lot of uh talented people out there that have so mm -hmm. much knowledge and you know maybe maybe some of you guys out there don't want to ask questions because you feel like you're imposing or you're you know you're asking too much and like uh mm -hmm. it's it's kind of just that person you don't want to be but you never know you know i try to answer as much as i can you know i don't i'm not going to be like hey do this do this do this do this i'm going to tell you i'm going to tell you things to get you on that path you know i'm going to if if you're not out there doing the homework then the things that i tell you are going to do no good for you yeah i mean for everyone who's tuned in right now when we release the recap you probably are going to want to go back and listen to that segment cuz that is some of the best info we've had on here in a minute for people just to, you know, not only, you know, be obsessed with the quality, but to leverage what information you can. And, you know, we've seen that a lot of hash makers are pretty willing to share information, you know, and, and in fact, it seems like that's really how this industry has gotten to where it is and kind of just like Cuban who commented and thanks for joining us, man. You know, hash makers have been sharing techniques for ages and, you know, wor working with each other to do the same thing. So I think most people in here probably are following you and, and other hash makers, but that advice was golden, man. Nice. Yeah, I'm glad so, I can uh, give some, some piece of knowledge to everybody. Yeah. Uh, I You know, one of the things you just said in there that I really want to ask you about too is how do you feel about, you know, food grade solventless oils? You know, let's say you kind of hit a bummer with your yield or your color. It's not quite the, the shelf product you want. Do you think it's a good idea to pivot those into topicals, edibles, things like that? Like, wh what's your what's your thoughts on solventless infused products? Uh, I think they're really cool and all, but, you know, like, just the way I feel about it is like, you know, an edible, for instance... Mm -hmm. I just think having terpenes in an edible doesn't make sense, but hmm. it's still a good path to get there. You know, if you have some good quality or decent food grade rosin, mm -hmm. yeah, put it into an edible for sure. Where else is it going to go? Topicals, things like yeah. that is is a great is a is a great way to source it or to 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 create products with that. But mm -hmm. like, you know, for me the most optimal product you could probably make for that would be taking some low grade and and running it through a mechanical separation process of, of separating the terpenes from the THC fraction 
Because mm -hmm. if you take that THCA and you decarb it, you know, you have pure THC, tasteless, smell, no yeah. smell. So, you know, imagine having that in an edible and how great that edible could potentially be. Because mm -hmm. I think a, a big factor with a lot of edibles is that is that taste. Like if, if you can totally remove that cannabis taste out of it, because I don't think yeah. people eat edibles because of the cannabis taste. They eat edibles <laughs> yeah. because, you know, they do the trick. It's their, their preferred method of uh, uh, consuming cannabis or, or mm -hmm. you know, and I just feel like, you know, removing like the, the part that's not going to get you high and it's really not going to play a role when it comes to, because I mean, if you're cooking it, dude, you're burning off the terpenes anyways, but right. there's going to be something left behind. And I feel like that's what's responsible for a lot of that taste. You know, like the guys out there doing edibles with distillate, mm -hmm. in a sense, like if you, if, you, if you take some low quality rosin, separate the THCA from it, mm -hmm. like that just shits on it, dude. It really does. I mean, I don't know that it's a viable method yet, mm -hmm. but at some point it will be. And that's, that's, that's kind of what we're working on. And, um, you know, it's all about learning how to do it on a small scale and, and having a total understanding of what you're doing, learning how to remediate, learning how to, to adjust when needed, and then learning how to scale it up from there. Cause you don't just scale mm -hmm. up and then, you know, invest all that into that and, and not even know what to do. It's, I think it's just mm -hmm. teaching yourself along the way to, to do it in the biggest way possible. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. But that's, that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think especially in California, and this is just my opinion only, it seems like the high end dabable concentrates are really a big part of the market. Uh, in other states, we've seen other places take off, like Arcadia Brands in Oklahoma. They're pretty much the number one edibles company out there, and they do all solventless. And then you've got Papa and Barkley in California doing topicals, and all of theirs are from SIFT. I mean, I guess it just seems like there's so much possibility with solventless right now. I mean, the possibilities are almost endless. Would you agree with that? I agree 100%. I, I mean, I feel like solventless is just the cleanest version of extract. Hydrocarbon is essentially the same mm -hmm. thing, just made through you know hydrocarbons you know it's something that that you know if we're in this this whole mindset where you know we want to eat better we want to live better so i mean you, you reflect that all the way to to what you're smoking and stuff like why wouldn't you want to smoke solventless and why wouldn't you want to eat it solventless too yeah yep i i agree uh, a lot you know health is wealth it sounds so cliche but it's so true and i think a lot of people who are into solventless feel the same way do, do you see solventless products getting a little bit less expensive as the technology scales, which is, of course, something that we're intensely focused on? But, you know, we hear a lot that the cost is a big barrier to entry for certain people. Do you think that that's going to change or do you think solventless is always kind of going to command that premium no matter what? I think it's going to stay around the same. I mean, mm -hmm. so... In the rec market, what's really killing it is the taxes. You know, all these taxes yeah. and regulations and all these these things that everybody has to pay. And it's like in order to actually make money, you have to tax. And mm -hmm. it's it's really it's it's tough for the consumer to understand that. But at the same time, I still want to give you a product. You know, so yeah. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do everything I can to get it as cheap as possible. You know, and as quality as without without affecting quality. You know, if I'm gonna scale up. I'm mm -hmm. only going to go to the point that I'm able to achieve the consistency and quality that that I search for. You know, I'm never, ever going to 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 give in to like mass producing. I don't want to be that brand. I don't want to be the brand who's worldwide or who's uh, in every state, you know, unless mm -hmm. we can figure out how to do it with consistency and quality. And that's the key mm -hmm. factor in everything. Yeah. So scaling up quality is one of the most difficult things for any hash maker or any business to do. Uh, it sounds like that that's something that a lot of places still haven't quite figured out yet. Would you agree with that? I agree. I agree for sure. But you know, with like, with the equipment you guys are putting out and there's, mm. there's some other guys out there putting out new equipment. It's just, mm. it's, it's evolving and it's evolving quickly, yeah. you know, and it's just a matter of time before, you know, you can just order some equipment from, from, from somebody and now next thing you know like you know you're you're still able to achieve what what you wanted but you're mm -hmm. you've scaled it up you've doubled up on your your process or you've doubled up on on what you can do you know without yeah. without affecting anything and you know i think the equipment's coming into play you know for yeah. for most of the people who who've been killing it with water hash and rosin and all that i think mm -hmm. you know they they probably have their own type of equipment that they've either 
mm-hmm. rigged up or had someone custom fabricate or um you know but for the most part i think the equipment that's on the mm-hmm. market nowadays is, is really helping with scalability mm-hmm. and um you know it's 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 definitely mm-hmm. going to get get better and and i think the cost will go down as as uh you know i'm just afraid mm-hmm. of the race to the bottom in this whole market you know people yeah. are just trying to get cheaper and cheaper prices and and what scares me when that's in place is you know what 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 do you give and and people are giving up quality and i think yeah. the ones that are doing that are the ones who don't understand what quality even is to start yeah you know if you have that eye for quality how could you ever be like oh uh, yeah i'll accept this you know we're making 20 times we ever did in in gram weight but it's not as good i would never accept that like what what would be the whole point of doing it you're mm-hmm. totally going against like unless that's who you are and what you were aiming for for me mm-hmm. it would be totally going against what i am and what i what i want to achieve so i'd rather just be small batch you know even if i'm mm-hmm. the most expensive on the market if i can't give you the quality that that the best quality then mm-hmm. then i don't even want to put it out Right. So, you know, I I I can tell obviously that your standards that you hold yourself to are super super extremely high. Uh, you know, going forward with your business and, you know, the brand that you're working with and, you know, your your partners and everything. What what kind of products are you guys looking to put out there? You know, hash rosins of a whole bunch of different varieties. Do you guys have any exciting things coming up that people should be looking for you know I'd love to turn as many people here on to your products and you know talk about some of the products you're excited about making and that you're making right now I mean my main focal point is going to be uh you know live rosin um mm-hmm. water hash um and eventually you know as I as I learn to like scale things up and fine tune mm-hmm. my process on on with some repeatability and some uh and scalability you know mm-hmm. eventually THCA and and probably not the terpenes maybe not sauce you know mm-hmm. at some point i kind of see those going in the carts and mm-hmm. just uh putting out the THCA fraction out there for you know if someone wants to cook with it if someone mm-hmm. wants like some people like to smoke that yeah. all by itself i had my phase where i was smoking THCA you know but i kind of just i'm not super big on it anymore it's it's mm-hmm. great it's really cool and it can be like it can be super beneficial in many aspects you know one of my family members i give him a bunch of the thca and he has diabetes and he gets to the point where his feet hurt so bad he can't even walk and Damn. he smokes the thca and he's like he wants to cry you know the guy can go out and do things he can walk yeah. and no pain and you know to see things like that from something that i thought was super recreational and not very medicinal it mm-hmm. that makes me feel good you know and it makes me want to learn how to get that product out there on a on a whole new scale but you know i think our focus is going to be water hash um rosin and then eventually like the the pens and stuff and and down the road i do want to start putting out like um just some regular hash you know like not yeah. six star you know i really i'm yeah. i'm a big fan of hash whether it be yeah. you know like my preferred six star like shit that i can dab and melt mm-hmm. but i i like bull topper like Yeah. GC fucking dark cash like you know when when you get like the <laughs> the bottom of the bag you know you're at like spin 5 and and things are just like you know you got your you got your portion of the yield that's all the yeah. quality and now the rest yeah. of it you know you can press it into some low grade rosin but yeah. you know i have so many friends and like people that really appreciate that hash and that's really mm-hmm. where i came from dude like i fell in love with hash and like 2009 or something like we I went to Amsterdam and that was the only thing I wanted to get was hash like we pick up flowers from here and there and write our little yeah. list but I was the one always picking up like oh I can get 5 <laughs> grams from here okay boom I want one of this one of that and shit was like 12 bucks a gram or like 12 Ooh. euros or something so I was yeah. like dude I snuck all the hash back home like <laughs> <laughs> I I had to dude I fell in love with it. So, you know, for me like that's that's the roots. You know, that was the hash that I remember and the fact that there's so many people that have leveled it up and and you know, taught their ways and and you know, it's allowed me to become someone that can really produce such a high quality hash that I can enjoy and that I can make for others to enjoy and put my own spin on it like yeah. I appreciate hash to the fullest whether that be sip whether that be just some traditional bubble hash or that be mm-hmm. some six star you know what i mean yeah so hash of all varieties 
good, uh, chances are you're going to enjoy it. Yeah, you know, and it's just, if there's something for everybody, someone who doesn't really know much about Six Star and they want that, that cheaper hash or that something to put in their joint and smoke a snake in the grass or uh, yeah. you know, break up on top of their bowl, like, those are always cool. Those are cool experiences, too, that we forget about, you know? Like, I love taking some, like, old school hash and, you know, rolling it up into a snake, dropping it into a blunt or into a joint and, and make that thing burn forever, you know? And, like, that's something I've been doing forever, but it's still enjoyable and it's a really good experience and most people really don't even know what the hell it is so to get it out there it's like it's almost like a new product for some mm -hmm. but i think it's something that there, there's there's a great experience to a lot of things and anything solventless mm -hmm. can be great you know obviously we're not trying to smoke on some food grade oil but yeah you know it's maybe somebody does but for me like i would say that needs to just go to food and there would be a whole level where it's like okay here's your traditional hash mm -hmm. here's your food grade hash and here's your six star yeah your top and then here's your rosin grade gotcha no that that's awesome uh snake in the grass that's a term i haven't heard in a long time so thank you for reminding me of that because that's hysterical <laughs> uh we've got about nine minutes left here just last reminder to everyone thank you all for tuning in I'm gonna ask just a couple more questions and then the whole recap will be up today on instagram if you didn't catch the whole thing and then also on youtube sometime next week so we record these and put everything up so that everyone can watch them so with the time that we've got remaining with you here phil uh, I, I wanted to dig a little bit back into some of the growing stuff because you really emphasized how important that is. Uh, and then probably also maybe just talk about some more technique stuff. So have you seen, do, do you think that organically produced flour is the ticket for solventless or do multiple methods of growing also produce great solventless? What, what, what's your take on the grow aspect leading into a solventless product? I mean, I've seen all kinds of different methods work great for solventless. A lot of it is genetics, but, you know, and I think it becomes a, a preference at some point. Like, I prefer soil right. grown flour, yep. but, you know, like, dude, what's <laughs> killing it right now is living soil, dude. There's people out there doing the living soil, and it's really just, it's, it's the best form of soil grown. You know, when you can create a symbiotic relationship between a plant and the, the, the soil that it lives in, you know, you're actually, you're doing it right. You're feeding the soil to feed the plant rather than feeding the plant directly you know mm -hmm. but there's people learn different ways and some people feed the plants directly whether that be you know bottle feeding through soil or um you know using like cocoa or, or uh, hydroton uh, rock wool and, and feeding mm -hmm. it salts and whatnot but you know i i can't really put down someone's method in cultivation because i'm not i'm not a, i'm not the greatest cultivator and I, it's really yeah. not my lane but i have seen great quality from every single way so hydro i've i've processed hydro and i've seen incredible product come from it you know but i would say number one is always soil grown flowers as far as like mm -hmm. the the terpene profile i feel like can be more enhanced um mm -hmm. you know a little bit raised in yield but there's so many factors for me to be like oh yeah soil grown mm -hmm. gives me a, a, a bigger yield Right. You know, unless I Maybe. have the same guy doing side by side Pepsi challenge, you know, it's really it's really tough to indicate or, or to even call that. But, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of living soil and, and, and my goal down the road is to be processing all living soil flour. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but we got to work towards that, you know, to start, you know, I think we're going to be doing a mix of everything. And then eventually it'll be completely everything soil grown because the group that I'm working with, they are. Um, they're adapting, they're changing, they're, they're, they're figuring out exactly the process that we want and that what, uh, the way we want our flowers and stuff. And mm -hmm. they're super open to the way we want things. And they're, you know, they're going to apply those methods. And like, we have two dedicated 70 light rooms that they're going to be doing uh, soil grown in. So that's going to be dedicated to the solventless. Uh, I'm sure at some point, you know, we'll, we'll mess around with some of their, um, uh, their hydro grown stuff try it out yeah. see what it does you know maybe mm -hmm. list it up there as hydro grown for people who who are interested in the differences and you know maybe yeah. they'll find that there is no difference you know it's really uh um you know if things are being done flawless and you're really tending to the plant i think uh you can really pull high quality uh resin you know but yeah for me number one soil 
And and if if you're if you're actually doing like the damn thing and like treating it like nature and creating that rhizosphere and and doing that whole, you know, natural farming or just, you know, I think that's that's the best way. And I I would think that everybody would want to get to that point. It's just it's it's something we 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 didn't grow up learning. You know, we don't just automatically mm-hmm. know. And to to get that understanding of it, I think it's it's super interesting. And to any grower. Who gets wind of it? I think that should be a super interest because, like, for me as an extra- extract artist, if I heard of like you know someone、mm. killing it doing this new method, I'm gonna be、yeah. all over it, you know. And and as a grower, that's your lane. If if someone's like, oh, they're killing it in living soil or this, and you're like, nah, I'm doing good with what I'm doing, you're、yeah. just staying stagnant. You, you're not moving with the wind, and you're not you're not evolving with the people, and you're not、mm-hmm. you're not you're not even learning. If you're not living, if you're not learning, you're not living. So I think、yeah. you should be out there trying to do new and better things, and the better things are living soil, soil-grown flower. That I mean, it's awesome. It's in the name.、Uh, that that's a great explanation about you know your philosophies on that. With with the remaining time we've got left, it's hard for me to choose what should be the last question here. But I, I do want to ask <laughs>、uh, when you're choosing the strains. That you're going to be washing? Are you working hand in hand with your growers, and they're helping you select it based it like really looking into the micro, the trichome size? Are you doing test washes like all of the above for everyone here who's tuned in? Like, you know, h- how do you figure out what strains you're going to want to wash and and which ones you choose to proceed with? You know, and the yields and all that. Yeah, dude, I've gotten a lot of help from growers, and I'd say one、mm-hmm. of the biggest.、Uh, um, The biggest ones to really help me lately, and in the it, you know in the last year or two would be、uh, Stinky Farms, dude. They absolutely kill it with soil grown flowers. They're so so proactive as far as popping new strains, pheno hunting,、um, their methods of growing. I mean, there's shit that I see other people putting out and it doesn't yield well, but their stuff, it's just like wow, dude. What the fuck, your stuff? It's dumping or it's <laughs> or it's actually putting out quality, you know, and almost everything that they do. Turns to fire. So, like you know, to get to work with them, you know, they have、mm-hmm. a deep understanding of the process too, and they work with me. And it's like, hey,、mm-hmm. we can we try this one out, or can we mix this, or can we do this? And it's like, you know, it's 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 not easy to find a grower who can really understand your process and stuff. But、mm-hmm. I mean, these guys go above and beyond. And and there's many other growers that I've worked with that have been the same. But these are just as of late, and、mm-hmm. and some of the most proactive guys that I've met. That as far as like. You know, popping new strains、yeah. and like things like that, dude. Like th- that's super important to me. And like, you know, it's like, hey, you know, this I hear these strains run well for solventless, and like, you know, they have a certain type of、uh, brand power that they can get them. And you know, it's like they do, and and they end up getting them, and they run them, and 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 then you know, I feel like that's where we we have a. a Mm. You know, a symbiotic relationship, as in, you know, they're growing good flowers, and I'm running them to see if they do great for solventless. And then, if they don't do good on on even resin period, and if they're not cutting it on their end, they know、mm. to cut it out of the garden and just like, you know. But, dude, the the grower is key. Growers are key, dude. You gotta love and respect your growers to the fullest, because we're nothing without them. Yeah, and and shout out to Stinky Farms. I think they were either tuned in before, or they still were. They were putting a couple. Emojis in there,、uh, you know. We've been following them and just seeing their pictures for a long time. Like, it, it's awesome to you know see that you're working with growers and have over time that are like so so keyed in on the process. So we've got literally about sixty seconds left here. I'd love you know if there's anything else that you just want to tell people who are tuned in, if you know when your products will be available or just anything else that you want to close with. Yeah. Okay. So, anybody out there doing the damn thing, or you know, having the passion, like I said before, you know, research,、mm-hmm. research, research. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Trial and error. Don't be、yeah. afraid of failure. You know, failure is a key to success. I think it's it's the best way to observe and learn how to correct. And、uh, you know, whatever you do, love it to the fullest, or find something else that you love. You know, and that's、mm-hmm. that's it. And you know that's my tip to you. I really appreciate everybody that's tuned in and everybody that supports. I love you guys. I do this for I do this for you, and I do this for myself, and I do this for for the Terps and just for the quality of just like you know creating fire out there and things that that we can all love and enjoy and ta- have talks like this over. You know, and it's 
I, I appreciate everybody. I really do. Well, it's about to kick us off. So and, thank uh, you, Phil. Let's talk more soon, okay? <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,